We had 16 people in two Dodge caravans. We carried with us everything that we could fit, and we drove to Costa Rica and then did a U-turn back to Guatemala. Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 63, Mormon Escape and Disillusionment, part two with guest Mike Collier. I'm Mark Kane. So the saga continues. It's like a docuseries designed for theological choice training. More on that in a moment. What's interesting to note, Mike didn't want the interview to be a sensationalized story of his uh, unique upbringing. But it's really not avoidable. It's what happened. It's his story. And I'm convinced that there's something powerful in hearing it. Like in a class, you are told information. It's knowledge that you take in and hopefully apply to your life. In a debate, you hear arguments and consider their merit. We learn in many ways. On this podcast, we have the opportunity to learn through the successes and disappointments of others, to experience the consequences of difficult decisions, poorly considered choices, or of wisdom. By opening up, my guests invite you into their lives, and you are there at these critical and life-changing junctures. Even as just an observer, your exposure to their choices can prepare you for your own. It's why people who desire a skill will train and practice and train some more. In a stressful situation, we become cognitively impaired and we will act on what we already know. We respond from the training and the thoughts that we previously embedded in our minds. This series, as with many of the interviews I've had, is like theological choice training. All these UCA stories are steeped in theology. Theology has consequences. You and I already know this rather deeply. It can be perilous. Episode 1. Now, I know we tend to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Like, we only make rational and highly thoughtful decisions. But might I suggest that it is indeed possible for us to be swept up in a movement, fused to its teachings and practices, and beholden to its leaders? Yeah, that happens. A quick note. We're preparing for the release of the 2022 UCA Conference paper presentations, still a month or more away. As you are waiting, I'm sharing segments from opening night. After today's interview, you'll get to enjoy Keegan Chandler's 10-minute opening remarks from the conference. Now, a 20-second recap. Mike was raised in a fundamentalist sect of the Latter-day Saints. His dad had started a commune at the Old Green Church. Several families had joined, believing that the true teachings of Joseph Smith were being restored. It wasn't working out as Mike had hoped. My son asked me this question. If half the population is male and half the population is female, but the males are marrying a greater percentage of the females, there would end up being males that have nobody to marry. It's disturbing the balance. <laughs> so how does that work? Well, it's interesting that you bring that up because in early Mormonism, after polygamy was uh, publicly announced, they began to develop a polemic, an apology against broader Christianity. Okay. And the apology actually addressed that. There's a surplus of women. It's a great evil. A lot of women... What do they call that? Old maidism is what they called it. Polygamy is the solution to this problem. <laughs> oh, so, oh. The poor women that can't find a husband. But according to some Muslim program that I saw, um, they said that there's basically equal male and female children born. But this was their polemic, by the way. But more male infants die before adulthood than females. So it left a surplus of females. 
Okay. But was was that part of the tension here? I mean, were there cases of men in your small group who were like, but right. it, it doesn't answer the real world situation. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> when, yeah. when you're looking around and, and one person's married to three and you're still single. Right. Well, I mean, I didn't really experience that because it didn't go on and continue in that way long enough to, you know, see what end that would arrive at. But, um, Basically, the big fundamentalist group, they split pretty much right down the middle. Okay. One of them had their headquarters in Salt Lake. The other one had their their place down in Colorado City. Mm-hmm. And that's right on the border of Arizona and Utah. In that Colorado City group, the leadership and, and all the marriage is placement marriage there. Okay. Oh. So the prophet tells everybody who to marry. You know, and he's been on the news. This isn't a secret. There's lots of documentaries about him on YouTube. <laughs> Okay. Warren Jeffs. Okay. He's in prison right now (laughs) for marrying underage girls. All right. Anyway, so he tells everybody, and this is, you know, a tradition that he inherited too, because his father was the leader before him and he told everybody who to marry and it went before him too, I'm pretty sure. But anyway, so about 10 or 15 years ago, all these girls that were considered to be old enough to marry, they just happened to end up with men that are the more prominent leaders oh. <laughs> for some strange reason. I mean, or their sons, right? Yeah. So if your father is like kind of a big wig in the group, then you're going to get a wife. Mm, got it. And there was a lot of boys that were creating distractions because if he had a rebellious boy or something, you know, he might like a girl. And if that girl will listen to her father, who's following what their prophet tells him to do, then he'll never get her. But, you know, there's some rebellious girls too, right? Okay. (laughs) So apparently there was a problem. There was a competition going on. And so they just (laughs) decided to get rid of all the boys. (laughs) Ah, so they just dismissed a group of men from the fellowship to eliminate the problem of jealousy and wandering desires. Right. They just cut it off. Because think about it. I mean, a girl that had a feeling for a boy... You know, she might be, you know, able to be told by her father and obey her father in marrying someone that the prophet approves of. But if she had a desire for somebody, you know, and he was able to hang around her and say, hey, you know, you know, you don't believe this and try to sway her to him. Well, that's obviously going to happen, right? Mm. Okay. And the answer to the problem was... uh, a bulk dismissal. Right. But most of these guys were boys. I mean, they were teenagers and some of them were quite young. I think uh, at least as, as young as 16 or 17, but maybe even younger than that. Mm. There were some that weren't considered really old enough to be on their own. Let's put it that way. And they were sent on their own. Wow. Well, that's one way to solve the problem of the uh, the balance. Yep. So they're the lost boys of Colorado City. All right. I'll leave that as an exercise to the listener to... Uh, do some research on that particular element. Yeah. So back to then your group, the tensions were rising. Um, somebody had already rewritten the golden rule and announced <laughs> it to everybody. Right. Uh, I was wondering if the marriage things was a problem, but it sounds like there was enough other problems. Oh, there was enough other problems. There was lots of other problems. <laughs> okay. So then what happened? Part of the problems were involved that though. Part of the problems involved uh, prospective marriages, you know, and mm. desires that weren't met and jealousies and stuff. And um, I kind of got an interesting experience only at the age of like 21 mm. where I'm like giving counsel to 35-year-olds and 40-year-olds, you know, and, I, I'm, and I'm listening. I'm listening to people's stories. I'm listening to their issues and their problems. And, and I'm trying to like bring everybody into harmony here. Mm. So I was kind of like um, a peacemaker, you might say. Okay. But it was almost in a little bit, I mean, not officially, but kind of an authoritative way because I was my father's successor, ah. which I haven't brought that up. But I, mean, I guess it would make sense, right? Because Well, right. It, <laughs> you were following in his footsteps, clearly. Your, right. your studies and your involvement, it, it only made sense. Yeah. So then you must have been a big disappointment after what, <laughs> after what happened next. Well, <laughs> I began to take issue with s- some of the complaints were economic 
people felt like the United Order was being, you know, ran and the one pot and who had control and what the money was being spent on. And Mm. some of the issues were about that. Naturally. Naturally. (laughs) And uh, at least in one case, one of the families had a disgruntled issue about some of this. And after hearing them out, I sided with them. (laughs) Oh. And uh, the issue now that I remember was they had felt coerced to give everything. So they were kind of like Ananias and Sapphira who kind of held back a little bit. (laughs) Mm. And um, they were kind of guilted into, um, you know, coughing it all up. (laughs) And uh, I, after hearing this woman who was in tears, I was pretty upset. I was pretty livid. And uh, there's a passage in the Doctrine and Covenants that talks about unrighteous dominion. Mm -hmm. Something like, um, no person has or ought to have any authority over anyone else except for through love and persuasion, by meekness. And and it says without coercion, basically. Mm. And I felt like, all those things were breached. And I took it upon myself to write it on the chalkboard <laughs> in the eating room so that everybody could see. And all I did is quote the scripture. I didn't say anything else. <laughs> mm. But anyway, my dad later said I should have brought it privately. Ah. You know, he didn't dismiss that maybe I had merit and what my feelings, but you know, I, I began to see differently than my dad on certain things and question things. And to feel like if this was really true, then I just felt like there should be better fruit. Yeah. I mean, we were claiming to be the, (laughs) the only teeny group on the earth that held the full authority and truth. And for some reason, I didn't feel like we were superior. As a matter of fact, the jealousies and human passions that were around, I knew of Christians that were more righteous than the lot of us. (laughs) Oh, oh. And living in the United Order was supposed to be this amazing unification. And it was supposed to be this beautiful thing where people loved each other and served each other and... And that's just not what I was seeing Hmm. during the Bill Clinton administration when Bill Clinton was all about, what was his uh, attorney general's name? It was Janet Reno. Yes, Janet Reno. So it was all all over the news all the time about, oh, we got to get all these cults. And the reason it was is because of the Waco thing. Oh, yes. Waco, Texas. Right. Because one of the women that were in the compound We're in our commune, I should say, a little bit more friendly, right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) It was her brother-in-law. Was uh, he worked for the CIA, and he said to her, "You need to be careful because you're under surveillance." Mm. One of the main newspapers in Utah, the Salt Lake Tribune, came out with an article showing all the cults in Utah. You know, and it actually it had a little map and it had, you know, all these little communes in Utah and ours was on there. And we were, we were insignificant compared to other ones in number wise, but I mean, we were on there. Congratulations. (laughs) So, well, we thought the end of the United States was here, you know? And so we went to Guatemala. Oh, so had Waco already happened at that point? Yeah. Waco had happened. So the whole country was up in arms and all, cultophobic <laughs> <laughs> so we had seen some black helicopters fly over our house and directly and kind of close and because of all this and probably because some of the earlier LeBaron leaders of this group had pointed to Mexico in Central America I think it had something to do with it at least that my dad felt like We needed to leave the country, so therefore we were going to go down there. We were going to go to Central America. Okay, so Waco (laughs) happened. You found out you you were on the map, and you the whole compound, the whole 
the whole commune? We went down there. We had 16 people in two Dodge caravans. We carried with us everything that we could fit in those caravans. And we drove to Costa Rica and then did a U-turn back to Guatemala. Um. Uh, like, like for the for the folks like me who, you know, my dad was a pastor. I went to Sunday school every week. I had my lessons. And when I got to high school, exciting. I argued with my traditional Christian friends. We stayed up late at night. And and, and, and nowhere in my story did I get into a van and drive to Guatemala. Mm-hmm. There, I could tell you a couple stories in that story. <laughs> well. I mean, just real quick. I'll okay, tell yeah. you. Like, we were driving at 1 o'clock at night on the way to Costa Rica. Uh, I think we were in Honduras or Nicaragua. And I mean, looking back, I think, I can't believe we were doing this, you know? (laughs) Anyway, it was one o'clock at night and we were switching off driving. Yeah. And we were on this high mountain pass. All of a sudden, the road (laughs) was gone. (laughs) The road had sloughed off and there was hardly even, I mean... We could have just driven off of a cliff. Oh. No road. And we were exhausted. We were tired. We were dirty. <laughs> so you saw it in time to hit the brakes and be like, all right. Yeah, like, oh, what's that? Where's, you know? And uh, just that we could have died. Oh. We could have been robbed. You know, we were in big cities and places in areas that it would be like being in the Bronx. Mm. Actually, one guy said this is way worse than the Bronx. <laughs> Oh. And we were just sitting there like dumb green goes asking questions like, you know, how do you get here? We couldn't even understand the answer. Oh. <laughs> so you just the your your core group then heads to Guatemala. Right. Right. Did you establish a location or Well, we bought some property down there. And um we didn't have a lot of money. But my dad traded one of these Dodge caravans. It was still in decent condition for Cinco Manzanas. <laughs> I learned to speak a little bit of Spanish. Okay. Cinco Manzanas, I think it's like 10 acres. We were there for a year. Okay. Nobody else came down? Nobody else came down. My dad left. I was there with my dad's, one of his other wives. He left. He took one wife. He left the other one that was my age. Oh. My mom wasn't there, but some of her kids were there other than me. And my dad's other wife, she had, I think she only had one child at the time. So she had a child. And then my wife and I, we didn't have any children. When we got to Costa Rica, remember I said we did a U-turn? Yeah. She just, she was done. She was done. I mean, just imagine eight people to a minivan and you've got the whole bottom loaded with like buckets. And so you threw your bedding on top of the buckets and you're laying on there, you know, with only like maybe 16 inches between you and the ceiling, right? What were the buckets? Your supplies? Buckets of all of our, what we thought was the most important thing to bring with us, thinking that we might never be able to come back and get more. <laughs> okay. But you laid on your supplies. Yeah, we lay down yeah. on the supplies. Yeah. Sleeping bags, oh. blankets, on top of all this. You know, we tried to make it as flat as possible. But we drove from southern Mexico all the way to Costa Rica. We didn't we didn't stop at any other place. We didn't we didn't rent a hotel or a motel. We didn't take showers. Oh my god. All right. You're she was done when you hit Costa Rica. You turned around. Costa Rica, my dad finally broke in and mainly to pacify my wife. And he got a place to stay. It was on the Pacific side. We were at Hako Beach. And we were there for a couple nights. And she just said, I'm going. She'd gotten to town. She'd gone on the phone. And she called her sister. And her sister purchased a flight for her. So not having children was kind of a real sore spot. And then we didn't know why. But she wasn't getting pregnant and she was worried that, you know, she might never have kids. And here in this extreme situation, when the emotion and the tension is just was really high and she told me she's gone. And like, we don't know if we're coming back. 
Mm-hmm. You know, they're going to close the border, right? <laughs> I mean, all kinds of things we were thinking of. <laughs> you a lot of paranoia. Yeah. A lot of paranoia. We had good reason to, though. You know, cults were on watch. <laughs> and we <Yeah>. were a cult. <laughs> okay. It's nice. I can look back at it with a smile, huh? <laughs> I just can't believe all of these things happened to you. I just, I'm, st- okay. Anyway, so, so you thought it was all over. She was leaving. Um, I was saying about our kids that mm. it was kind of a real sore spot with her. Yeah. And three months after, I didn't have a phone call. She didn't make an attempt to contact us by any means that was available until three months later when she called and she wanted to talk to me and she said she was pregnant and she was kind of happy. Oh. And so she was in somewhat better spirits, even though I don't think it was without reservations because of my dad. Yeah. But ultimately she came back down to Guatemala. I see. Yeah. And maybe she had been a little bit emotional. <laughs> maybe it was the yeah. pregnancy that was putting on the extra stress too. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you no longer lived in a van. You were ac- you actually had By the time she came back, yeah, we had a house. Yeah, okay. How did you decide to leave Guatemala then? I mean, were you eventually, okay, they're not going to do anything. Let's not live down here? Well, no, it was like, well, this is really where God wants us to be, but you know, it's kind of expedient that we go up and we we got to get jobs and make more money and then we'll come back down and mm. But in the end, you know, by then we had desires and wants and needs and so the money really didn't it was supposed to go to Guatemala but we just didn't go back <laughs> well I didn't go back yeah so after everybody was living up there for about a year it pretty much started to fall apart because of the tensions and um the more committed people to the group stayed Pretty much up until that point, I always was under the shadow of my father's, his guidance. Yeah. As I began to have interactions with other people and questions would be, would be brought up, you know, either doctrinally or what's right on issues. I began to form my own opinions and sometimes they began to veer from what my dad would say. And so... I began to question this whole thing that we were doing. I began to really look at it and see the fruit, and I felt like the fruit wasn't very good. But I wasn't ready to throw in the towel. Okay. But my wife got to the point where she began to have her doubts. (laughs) Okay. Understandable from what you're saying. (laughs) And so she said that she wanted to move away. I wasn't ready to to walk away from my dad's claim. No. Mm. I had kind of really been in doubt, but then the moment that I had just like came back in strong, that's when she left. Oh. And so she wanted to move away. And my dad was afraid that that would pull me from him. And he didn't tell me this until I basically dug it out of him later, but he sent me on a mission. To do what? Well, to get my mind in the right things oh, so that my wife couldn't have as much influence on me because I would be focusing on God and his kingdom okay, and building it. And was that mission away from the group? It was uh, in Mexico. Oh. So I've told you how my dad had gotten in partly to this LeBaron family. The LeBarons had a main branch that had followed the other brother that my dad didn't follow. And so he sent me down there to try and hopefully convert some of them people Mm. to his claim. And an ulterior motive of that was to potentially protect you from the influence of your wife who was becoming very disenchanted with the group. Well, I mean, I know that he meant well. Mm. But I mean, why not? Take care of two birds with one stone. So he sent you to Mexico. And was your wife there when you got back or was that it? So she had already moved to Denver. And our second child was just born. Okay. 
anyway, it was a heart wrenching departure. Let's put it that way. Mm. A lot of these families that had came had left with nothing, with no finances. I mean, some of them were actually pretty well off, but a lot of their families were split apart. Their lives were changed forever. A lot of the people weren't people of faith in God anymore. Okay. And so seeing that so often, and now I'm going on this mission, and even though I, it all makes sense theologically in my mind, it just doesn't make sense in my heart. Mm. So when six months were passed, I found out that it was over between me and my wife. You were in Mexico when you found out? Yeah, I was in Mexico. My dad was talking to my companion, and he told him not to tell me. But I dug it out of him, because I, I kind of could hear the conversation. So, mm. but that, I mean, that made me upset. That made me really upset. Yeah. And I just made the decision, well, for like a day, I just, I couldn't do anything anymore. And to be honest, when I was down there and, you know, trying to proselyte people to this. I just had this terrible fear. What if this isn't true? Mm -hmm. Intellectually, it made sense. Of course, you know, a lot of things make sense to you based on the frame you're given as a child, right? Yeah. I mean, you ever try to talk to a Trinitarian? In their worldview, in their theological view, it all makes sense, right? Yeah. Well, it all made sense to me. And so one day we were talking to this guy who had led us in his house mm -hmm. and um, I just excused, I, I said, could I use your bathroom? And he said, oh yeah, sure. It's down the hallway or whatever. But, and maybe I was a little emotional because of the situation, but I didn't have to go to the bathroom. I just, I just bawled like a baby and I just prayed and I said, please God, don't let me, don't let me believe a lie. And if this is not true. Help me to see it. And I just wept. I just, I, I had all this, this burden. And just by weeping, I just felt like it was lifted. <clears throat> and I thought about what I was going to do. And I came to a decision that I was going to go back and see if I could save my marriage. Mm -hmm. So I went back and I found out that it was, it was over. She was done. And she said to me, you'll never leave your father. And that's why, I, that's why it's over because I know you'll never leave. Wow. She had in her mind, she wanted us to be together. She wanted us to be a family. She wanted me to just provide for her and not and basically I was giving all possible extra resources over the bare minimum lifestyle to the kingdom of God. I thought, you know, yeah. My views on the kingdom of God have changed a bit since then. <laughs> and it was sad to see these people and their families that had gone from believing faith. I mean, at least they believed in God, right? Yeah. To pretty much either to new age or to atheism altogether. The people who came in with high hopes basically it crushed the faith right out of them and they left yeah faithless that's right this experience and my dad would say that was because they didn't he would say because they turned away from the truth but a lot of these people were just beautiful people they had peaceful loving households okay and one one guy ended up later getting addicted to meth and getting his kids all addicted to meth and it was just a nightmare. Oh, my gosh. <clears throat> not quite the kingdom of God. No. No, not. So you returned. You couldn't patch your marriage together. And I couldn't tell her I was going to leave my dad then either. I mean, I'd just been on this mission, and even though I was having doubts, I wasn't ready to still throw in the towel. Mm. So then I left where she was at and I went back to the, the compound, <laughs> the, the, the old church. Mm -hmm. You can erase the compound if you want. <laughs> <laughs> and 
I was just in emotional turmoil, you know? Yeah. I, I wept on my younger brothers. who was only like 16. I just wept on his shoulder like a baby, you know, because of my marriage and, and just the pain and just thinking I'm going through all this pain because of the truth. And I really had to ask myself that question, but I couldn't answer it. And for about a day or several days, I think, I just meditated really deeply. And I came to the conclusion that I wasn't going back to Mexico, that I was going to be a part of my kids' lives. And I had two of them. And, and in order to be a part of their life, I had to have the means to be a part of their life. So I had to go get a job. Mm -hmm. So I went to the city and I got a job. Were you out of the group then? No, I wasn't mm. technically out, but you know, I think my dad was probably pretty concerned about me. Okay. I'm sure he was. So I got this job doing construction, framing. We framed houses. This guy was no... <laughs> he was no common employer. <laughs> he was LDS mainstream and he had converted to the LDS church when he was a teenager. Okay. But he was a, a visionary type and he was telling me all these visions that he had had mm. kind of a, a very different sort of employer. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I could, I felt the sincerity and I, I wanted to listen to him. I wanted to hear what he had to say, but in the end it, it touched me very much and over the course of i don't know a couple years it took me a long time i eventually joined the lds church mm. i think that god had a hand in that given my background experience i would never have been able to just go straight out of mormonism to a biblical unitarian faith mm. you know i was asking for truth i was asking god to guide me but I was only prepared to go so far. <laughs> mm. And so I think honestly that God did help me little by little, step by step. And it gave me experience. It gave me experience in the mainstream, which is a lot more normal to mainstream Christianity, even though it's considered pretty weird, but I mean, it was at least a more normal life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, modern Mormonism is, you know, you're not in a commune, not, <laughs> I mean, you, you work, you can do things like, buy a house. Hmm. For me, I felt guilty. Just, I felt selfish just buying shampoo and toenail clippers. <laughs> I mean, I guess my dad had always drilled in us, you know, the people just, they serve their job and they, they serve mammon. And uh, he had kind of like drummed that in us a lot. Hmm. And I think it was probably those statements that made me feel that way. I think there's some truth there. I mean, I'm not, on a certain level, you know, people yeah, are vain. Yeah. Yes. People do serve money. <laughs> right. Now you had gotten that job in hopes that you could reconnect with your family and your kids. I mean, be a part of their life. Like I would have to have a car to go see them and maybe have them on weekends or visit them or whatever. Okay. So you did establish some connection with them. Yeah, I did. Eventually I had them every week. Okay. That sounds like then you were able to build an actual relationship with these guys and and that's fantastic. I'm just reflecting on what could have been a, a separation that never really got patched. Yeah. If you hadn't worked at it, it worked out okay. You know, at the time back then, my ex-wife was pretty much going the route of unbelief. Mm. And I remember feeling like I just wanted my children to know that God loved them. I felt like I had known God's love. You know, I prayed for them and I just wanted them to know God's love. I didn't pray for them to know Mormonism was true or my dad was true or whatever. I, I just prayed for them to know God and know God loved them. At the time, that meant way more than bantering over authority or, <laughs> or interpretation or anything. Yeah. Just know there was a God know that there was a creator and know they were created for a purpose and love. Yes, there will be more episodes. 
we've got some new events for 2023 on the website, unitarianchristianalliance.org forward slash events. In January, there's a young adult event in Massachusetts, or young at heart, and a youth camp in Indiana. Then in March, it's a men's conference in New York and a family event in Indiana, which is free. Then three events in April, a woman's conference in New York, a conference in Tennessee, and here's a new type of event for our event list, a trip to Israel. That's in April. I'm thrilled to see all of these options. And if you are making plans for something, be it as simple as a one-day event with barbecue, or maybe your group is planning a fully organized event, and if you are welcoming other Unitarian Christians from various backgrounds to join you, then go and follow the instructions on the events page to get your event listed there. That's unitarianchristianalliance.org forward slash events. I hope Mike's story has given you several opportunities to work through scenarios in your mind. Your experiences will vary, but there are patterns and pitfalls and struggles that are common to our faith journeys. If this story is helping you see the world more carefully, to think through your own choices with more patience, then it's working. Maybe someone else you know would benefit the same way. Suggest that they listen. A reminder that there's a UCA podcast newsletter, and a link for that in the show notes, and there's a YouTube channel for the UCA podcast as well. You can listen to me on YouTube, if you aren't doing that right now. And as a bonus, if you find closed captioning to be helpful, YouTube does it automatically. It's, it's not perfect at all. But if you want the help, like maybe English isn't your primary language, Closed captioning could be of help. Mike, thank you once again. It's been fantastic getting to know you, and you've really given me a lot to think about. And now, a bit different than normal, we're ending with Keegan Chandler from the 2022 UCA Conference Opening Night. Welcome, everyone, to the 2022 UCA Conference. Uh, my name is Keegan Chandler, and I am very honored to serve as the vice chair on the volunteer board of the Unitarian Christian Alliance, and I am equally honored to be your host for what should be a fantastic conference weekend. Um, there's definitely a lot to be happy about. We have a conference that is packed full of terrific programming. There are a variety of scholarly papers that will be presented over the next several days uh, in our main sessions, and there are also a variety of concurrent workshops as well on a variety of interesting and practical topics. We really think that there's something here for everyone this year, and there's also built-in time for fellowshipping, for networking with like-minded believers, for learning about new ministries and new projects uh, that you can be involved in in the wider Unitarian community. And as you can expect, all of this has required an immense amount of work behind the scenes. So it's very clear to me that our next official order of business needs to be to thank all of our conference partners, all of the volunteers, all of the speakers, and to uh, thank especially Alan Kane and Lawrenceville Church of God for opening up their campus to all of us. So if you could please join me and a round of applause for everyone who's volunteered. <laughs> And second of all, I want to congratulate all of you for making the decision to come down and spend some time with us in beautiful Ohio. Your decision to travel is not one that any of us have uh, taken for granted. This conference simply wouldn't be possible. It would not exist if it was not for good people like you who have decided to take time away from your families, from your friends, from your jobs to come down and to uh, spend some time with us. And to me, your presence here indicates that you not only believe, as I do, in the twofold mission of the UCA, which is to, on the one hand, promote Unitarian theology and also to connect Unitarian Christians together. But you also believe in the value of this event and the value of gathering together in the flesh to break bread. 
For me, this has been without doubt one of my most favorite things, if not my most favorite thing that I do each year. And I'm just so blessed that you've all decided to experience this with us. I want to ask all of you to commit to two things during this conference. The first thing is I'd like for you to ask three people that you don't know, what's your story? How did you become a Unitarian Christian? Or if you were born and bred a Unitarian Christian, how did you find the Unitarian Christian group that you participate in? Or how did you find the UCA at the very least? I'd like you to ask three people that. When you do this, you're going to be accomplishing a few things. The first thing you're going to be accomplishing is getting out of your comfort zone and meeting new friends, which is always good. The second thing you're going to be doing is you're going to be fulfilling that half of the UCA mission to connect Unitarians together. And third, and perhaps most importantly, you're going to be learning that there are areas of overlap with other people's stories, but there are also areas of great difference. For example... Um, maybe you and the person you're speaking with, maybe you both uh, were kicked out of the church that you grew up in when you decided to become a Unitarian Christian. But maybe one of you uh, grew up Southern Baptist and the other Roman Catholic. Or it might be that you were both drawn to the Unitarian Christian view by the same biblical text, but one of you belongs to one Unitarian Christian group and one of you belongs to another. My hope is that in doing this is that your perspective on what the body of Unitarian Christianity really looks like will be enriched by an awareness of both the similarities and the differences that you have with your fellow conference goers. The reality is, is that we all agree that the one God is the Father and that Jesus is his human son. But apart from that, we're quite diverse in other areas. Some of us were born into Unitarian communities. Some of us were members of Trinitarian denominations formerly or oneness denominations. Some of us have been asked to leave our churches. Some of us have been communities of one, lone wolves, so to speak. When uh, Dr. Tuggy and I were first discussing the idea of the UCA, we described the modern Unitarian movement as an island of misfit toys. But this evening, I'm so very thankful that through the grassroots efforts of all of your organizations, through your individual efforts online, through the wonderful platforms and tools that are now available to us, like the UCA directory and map, all of these toys, they don't have to be misfit anymore. They can each find their home. And I want to make it clear that their home is not the UCA. The UCA is a gateway. The UCA is a path towards homes with all of you, in your churches, in your home fellowships, in your halfway meetups at restaurants and coffee shops. This is where misfit toys find their fit. It's true that we are all united together for the sake of this larger vision, but make no mistake, we are also very different from each other in many ways. Notice that I have not said yet this evening that our differences don't matter, that they're not important. I'm actually convinced that it's not simply our agreement on Unitarian theology that makes us strong as a movement in the Christian world, that makes us a force to contend with. It's our differences which also make this alliance powerful. First of all, our differences mean that we as a body, as a movement, are able to service a wide variety of Christians from all denominational backgrounds and persuasions. Another way that our differences make the UCA strong is in the message that this diverse body of Christian believers ultimately communicates to the world about Unitarianism. Namely, that there exists an idea that is so powerful that it transcends denominational boundaries, that there is an idea which grips the hearts and minds of people from all backgrounds and causes them to unite together despite their differences, that there is an idea which compels people to risk alienation, to risk their reputation, to risk their financial security and even their own physical safety, that there is an idea that if given the chance, can change the world. I'm speaking, of course, about the radical idea that God is one, that God is only one, that God is not two, that God is not 
three or three and one. He's not one in some obscure way, but he is simply the one person who has made all things. This fact that there is one God, the Father, in my eyes, draws us all together so radically and so decisively that it makes serious cooperation with one another the only reasonable conclusion. As the prophet Malachi put it to us in Malachi 2.10, do we not all have one Father? Has not one God created us? The fact that this one God is our one Father should set a brotherly tone, I think, for Not just this event, but the way that we each live our Christian lives. As Paul once said by way of the poet Eratus, in him we live and move and have our being, and we are all his children. This idea of the brotherhood of all men as the creations of the one God, if this applies generally to humankind, then how much more so to the body of Christ, and how much more so to this body of Unitarian believers who have all been born, not of flesh and blood, but of a passion for the truth, the truth that God is one. So my prayer for everyone as we kick off this weekend is that this passion of the truth will drive us together, but that ultimately it will also drive us out into the world to motivate us to find new ways to reach the world, to love the world, and ultimately to change it for the better. Okay, so I asked you to do one thing, Here's the second thing I'd like you all to do. You are going to hear a lot of things at this conference. You're going to hear a lot from our, from our speakers in our main sessions. You're going to hear a lot from our uh, workshop coordinators. But if you let all of what you hear stay within these walls, then this event that we've all sacrificed for, that you've traveled so far for, it will not have met its full potential. Our hearts must be for the wider world. We must take what we gain here this weekend and spread it far and wide, both the theology that we're going to be equipped with and also the network of fellowship and partners that we've now all been so privileged to encounter. So in closing, please remember the mission this weekend. Meet three people you don't know, ask them their story, and make sure that what goes on at UCACon does not stay at UCACon.